Here's the sermon for today, okay? I want to start today's sermon with a question. Are you ready for the question? The question is this. If the government broadcasted a tsunami was coming in 24 hours, what would be an unwise response? Have you ever had those like messages that are alerts on your phone? It's like 5 a.m. and your phone starts buzzing uncontrollably and it's none of the tones that you've selected for text messages so that it actually wakes you up. And then you read, and then it's like Amber Alert, or so-and-so, or this thing is happening. We had one of those in Toronto. When we were in Toronto, we were at a restaurant eating peacefully. <laughs> and then they're like, there's a man with a gun shooting people outside in the public. Stay safe. Thanks. <laughs> and it was, it was an alert that came to all our phones, and it was from the government. So here's a good question. The question is this. If the government broadcasted that a tsunami was coming in 24 hours, what would be an unwise response? Something that is inevitable, something that is coming, something that is coming in a short while, maybe not relatively short because 24 hours still gives you a little bit of time, but it is short. I have some bad responses, some you know unwise responses that I want to share with you that I think that we could all agree that would be foolish. Unwise response number one would be, <clears throat> don't talk to me about it. I don't want to be scared. Can I ask you a question? How foolish would it be if there was a danger coming to you? There's a tsunami coming to you, okay? 24 hours. And the person that you're trying to warn, or maybe this might be you, they're trying to warn you. Can you imagine how foolish it would be if you responded with, don't talk to me about these things. I just don't want to think about them because I don't want to get scared. Please. Here's the truth. The tsunami does not respect your opinion. The tsunami does not respect your feelings. The tsunami does not respect anything that has to do with your feelings, your opinions, or anything that you're thinking about. It doesn't respect your thought life. The tsunami is coming, bro. Yeah. Whether if you are scared now, or scared later, never scared, or always scared, the thing is coming. Yeah. So the foolish thing to do is to try to avoid thinking about something that is inevitable. Yeah. Do I have all your agreement? Yeah. I feel like some of you are staring at me all lost and confused. Are you still here? Yes. I see some people going like... <laughs> Maybe you're processing. <laughs> Praise God. But it would be foolish for me to say, don't talk to me about a danger that is coming because I don't like how it makes me feel. Here's an unwise response number two, and it would be this. I don't believe in tsunamis. <laughs> and they can give you really good evidence to why they don't believe. Here's evidence number one. I've never seen one. Here's evidence number two. I've never lived through one, or, and, and I don't know anybody that has. None of my friends have ever lived through a tsunami. So you can't tell me that it's true because I haven't seen it. And in order for you to want me to believe it, I have to see it. Sure, keep staying there inside your house. And you will see it. But see how foolish it is for someone in authority, like the government, that has a lot of scientists... And they have a lot of tools that could actually give you the evidence and the proof that this thing is coming. Yeah. And for you to say, I understand and respect your opinion, and I understand that those that have authority to speak on such things are saying the opposite of what I believe in, but I just can't believe it because I've never seen it. Mm. Never seen it. Never lived in one. Foolish response. First response number three would be, let me think about it. <laughs> you can imagine, it's 5 a.m., okay? <laughs> 5 a.m., your phone buzzes, you get this thing that is telling you a tsunami's coming, and you read it, <laughs> and you're like, uh -huh. But then you just put your phone down, and you just sit on the edge of your bed, and, 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 and you're like, I wonder if this is true. <laughs> and your only action is to sit and think. Thinking about it is good, but you don't want that to be the last thing that you do. Yeah. And, and, and also, thinking about it is good only if what you're thinking about is what you're going to do. Yeah. Because some people might think about it and might be like, is this true or is this not? Should I believe it or should I not? But what about all my stuff? And what about my house? And what about all the things? I have to study. And you start thinking about the wrong things because you can think about it, but you can think about it the wrong way. Yeah. But would you agree with me? Wouldn't you agree with me? Don't you agree with me? Would you agree with me that it is foolish for the government, someone with authority, to warn you about a tsunami coming in 24 hours and all you do is say, let me think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Here's foolish response number four. And this is, I'll see what I do, dot, 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 later. 
So this is where you're like, I believe it. I understand it. I know I'm going to do something about it, but not now. Doesn't this sound a lot like life? I believe it, but let me do something about it tomorrow. Tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll start the gym tomorrow. I'll start the diet tomorrow. I'll start school tomorrow. I swear, tomorrow I'm going to sign up for the next semester of school. I swear. I swear tomorrow I'm going to go send out my resume. I swear tomorrow I'm going to go look for a job because I've been doing nothing this whole entire year. I swear tomorrow I'm going to do it and then tomorrow I'm going to make it better and tomorrow I'm going to make up for it and tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. I swear I'm going to move in tomorrow. I swear I'm going to move out tomorrow. We leave all things to tomorrow and guess what? Tomorrow never comes. Isn't it foolish if the government were to tell you there's a tsunami coming in 24 hours and you say, I'll do it later. Let me think about it. I'll think about what I do later. Here's the truth. This is the same thing when it comes to today's topic. Eternity. What is your response to this topic anytime that it's brought up? We are a generation that is the most biblically illiterate, I think, in all of human history. Gen Z, love you guys. It's for you that I have to preach hard. It's for you that I have to study extra harder. It's for you that I have to pray even longer. It's for you because you're biblically illiterate, all of you. That's the camera. I wasn't pointing at him, I was pointing at the camera. Gen Z is the most illiterate, biblically illiterate generation. And so here's what Gen Z is doing. They're worried and stressed about this life without a single care, without a single care. Do you know what a single care looks like? It's single, single, it's not plural. You didn't even give it one care, meaning there wasn't even one thought throughout your entire day. You did not even think about this once. You do not, this generation does not have a single care about eternity. Doesn't cross their mind. And the only time they think about it is if they're convinced to come to church. And if the preacher will touch on the subject that day. Because if they come to church and the preacher's not talking about it because he wants to sprinkle you with fairy dust to make you feel better, then you lost the opportunity to hear about it and to give it a single care. But this generation is not thinking about what matters most and what is the most inevitable, eternity. Jesus spoke about eternity. So Jesus is this historical figure. He's also a moral figure, but more than that, he is a deity. He is a God. He is the God. He is the image of the invisible God. And here's what Jesus spoke. Jesus said, I am going to come to earth. I'm going to live among you. They're going to kill me. My creation is going to kill me. I'm going to be dead for three days. But after three days, I'm going to rise. And he kept repeating it to his disciples. But his disciples, I don't know, were just hearing him but not listening to him. And God kept giving them clues. Hey, they're going to kill me. I'm just letting you know. Sneak peek. They're going to kill me. Then I'm going to rise after three days. Hey, they're going to kill me. By the way, did I tell you that they are going to kill me? And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 Lord. Eating without a care in the world. Without a single care about the inevitable, which was death. Jesus was talking to them about the inevitable. And Jesus dies. And guess what the disciples did? They all panicked. Even though Jesus had been telling them. Sometimes... God is trying to speak to you and you're just hearing him, but you're not listening. And just how he told the disciples, I'm going to die. And then they're going, I'm going to resurrect after three days. Here's what God is trying to tell you today. Hey, you're going to die. You're going to die. All of you. But you can resurrect. Just like I did. Jesus spoke about eternity. We just don't really think about what he spoke because we're just so invested in what other people say that he spoke. But let's look at Jesus' words when he spoke about eternity. Here's John chapter 10, verse 28. He says, I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Right there, he is stating there is eternity. Jesus is saying there is eternity. Second thing. We're going to read in John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is Jesus saying, And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one 
that you sent to earth. So Jesus teaches us that there is an eternal life. And the only way that we get to go to heaven and have eternal life and not perish is through God, Jesus Christ. So you can't get to heaven by being a good person. All of our lives, we've possibly been taught a lie, some of us, or the majority of us. We've gone to church, and without wanting to, the leaders actually taught us a twisted version of God's gospel, and that was your behavior takes you to heaven. So you better behave. You better behave good, because if you want to get to heaven, you got to be a good person. But the analogy I like to give us to contradict that teaching is this. If you lived in a mansion in North Vancouver, that's where all the rich people live, If you lived in a mansion in North Vancouver and someone came to your mansion, knocked at your door in the afternoon and they knocked and you opened and they said, I am here to move into your house because I am a good person. If you have your children in your house and you have your dog that you really love because we really love our dogs. He's like, amen, because he's a dog lover. Let me ask you a question. Would you let a stranger under the premise of I'm a good person to move into your house? That's what a lot of people want to do with God. They want to die. They want to go to his mansion up in heaven. And they want to say, knock and say, hey, I'm here to move in. And God's like, why? Yeah, I don't know you because I'm a good person. Good people don't make it to heaven. Bad people with a good shepherd called Jesus make it to heaven. Because it's never about what you do. It's never about how good I behave. It's not based on your works. It's based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Someone shout, amen. Aren't you glad that your salvation is not based on you? Aren't you glad that it's not based on you? How many of us know? How many of us know that if your salvation was based on you, you would have lost it 10 times today? So Jesus says, there's eternity. That means that after your body dies here on earth, your soul and your spirit keep on living. But the only way that you can make it to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus didn't just speak about eternity, period. He also specified and he says, and he spoke and taught that there was a hell. And I know that a lot of us don't like hearing stuff about hell because it scares us. But that's why I made the disclaimer or the premise of the sermon based on a tsunami saying, don't tell me about it because it scares me. We all know that that's foolish because it is inevitable. Someone say amen. amen. Let me tell you, eternity is inevitable. And there are two places in eternity. And one of them is hell. And Jesus spoke about hell more than he did heaven. Look what Jesus says. He says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, away from me, you that are under God's curse. Watch this. Away to the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So Jesus is saying, hey, it's not just all rainbows and butterflies in eternity. It's not just all rainbows and butterflies. And, and some of us, may be like, well, it's not loving for God to send people to hell. Well, the truth is that God doesn't send people to hell. Yeah. Yeah. You, when you were born, you were born evil. You were born a sinner. You were already walking to hell. But Jesus came and he made a way for you to have a way to heaven, yeah. to the Father. Yeah. And it's not that he's unjust or unfair. He's actually just and fair. Yeah. That's why he made a way for you so that we can go. But the way that it is, is that you just have to choose him. Yeah. You choose if he saves you or not. And another thing, when it comes to the topic of hell, some of us might be like, well, it's not really loving to talk about those things. As a matter of fact, I think it's the most loving. The fact that he's actually invested in telling you. So we need warnings. And Jesus is saying, there's a hell. And then Matthew 13, verse 49, 50, this is Jesus talking about it again. This is the way it will be at the end of the world. At the end of what? The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous. Throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus is speaking about hell. There is a hell. You need to know that. Okay? And eternity is a mighty long time. You don't want to spend the longest part of your existence in hell. You want to spend it in heaven. Now, Jesus doesn't only say that there's a hell. He says that there's heaven too. And he actually specifies that there are two places, not three. There is no biblical teaching on the purgatory. So there's not like one thing that you, like, it's not like you can die and then go to purgatory and have a second chance. This is what the word of the Lord says. It is appointed unto man to die once. And once you die here on earth, you're before God. 
So there isn't a purgatory where you can actually have all the bad mistakes get cleansed or people can pray for you here on earth so that you can have a second shot. There is none of that. There is no biblical teaching. Jesus teaches that there's only two places. Matthew 25, verse 46. He says, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. How many of you wish that you didn't have problems? Only 17 of you? Come on. <laughs> how many of you wish that you didn't have trials? Yeah. How, many of you wish, how many of you wish that you wouldn't have hurts in life? Yeah. How many of you wish that the people that you trusted the most wouldn't betray you one day? Yeah. Well, that sounded more fresh than all the other ones. Okay. <laughs> how many of you wish that you wouldn't have anxiety and fear and depression? How many of you wish that you didn't have to wrestle against darkness? Yeah. We have pretty dark days in Vancouver, huh? Okay, you know what you're wishing for? Perfection. Yeah. Essentially, do you know what you're wishing for? Heaven. Yeah. Every single one of us that has gone through tough times, tough things, to the point where we're like, I'm done with this life. What you're essentially saying is, God, I need heaven. Yeah. Where there will be no more weeping. Yeah. Where there will be no more suffering. Yeah. Where it will all be perfect. Do you know why you long for that? Because it has been written in your heart. Yeah. This is what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, I believe. Eternity has been written in our hearts. There is a longing in us for the eternal. Yeah. That is why we long for a perfect world where there's no pain or suffering or difficulties because we were made for something greater. We were made for something better and God has that greater. God has that better for you. It's called heaven and here's what God is saying. They will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous, say the righteous. righteous. Say I am righteous. righteous. Will go into eternal life. Heaven. There are two places, not three. There are two places, not one. There are two places, not seven levels of glory. It's what some religions believe and teach. There's only two places in eternity. Heaven or hell. Now listen, God wants everybody to go to heaven. But it's a choice. So as a church, and this is where our vision comes in, as a church, we want to work as hard as we can. Pierce through every obstacle that comes our way. Pierce through the pressure. Go through the Moments where we honestly don't feel like we can encourage anybody. Because it's, it's another level when you encourage. Okay, it's like one thing to encourage when you feel encouraged. It's one thing to bless somebody when you've been blessed by God. It's, it's one thing to greet people at the door all smiley when God gave you the promotion. You understand what I'm saying? But it's another level when you have to encourage people when you're discouraged. When you have to bless somebody when you're not blessed at all. You've been broke for two years. <laughs> you know why we go through all that? You know why at Crave Church we create a space of grace for imperfect people to crave God no matter what season we're in? You want to know why? Because of eternity. Yeah. Eternity. Yeah. We want to do everything that we can in our power for people to take decisions that will impact and improve their eternity. Yeah. I preach not so that you could feel great. I preach so that you could walk toward eternity. We're excellent with a worship team as best as we can be to our capacity, time, and capability. Not so that you could be like, wow, they're so good. No, so that you can feel God's presence so that it could drive you toward an eternal decision that will bless you so that you can have eternal life. You know, everything that we do here, we clean, we do whatever it takes so that people can come to our church and feel like they're being impacted for eternity. This is our why. Our why is not to build a brand. That's foolish. You know. How long it would have lasted just so that we can have a good church? Three to five years, max. If that was my why. You know why I'm still here? Fervent, strong, passionate, with vision for the next 10 years. You want to know why God has given me this grace and this fire to keep on going? Because my why. My why goes beyond what this world could offer me. My why is beyond even my own life. Look, I don't need to do, we don't need to do everything that we're doing. We're saved. We can just be saved, live quietly, peacefully, without impacting anybody's life, and still make it to heaven. But that's not our goal. Our goal is for other people to make it too. Yeah? 
So that's why we do what we do. Now, let me give you three things that are the basics to understanding eternity, okay? Three things, very simple. This is just basic understanding for eternity. This is our why, eternity is our why. Number one is this, you gotta understand belief and behavior. Your belief determines where you spend eternity. Your belief determines where you're going to spend eternity. Your behavior determines how you will spend eternity. So what's interesting is <laughs> that in a lot of the churches that we've possibly grown up with, they actually flip it. They tell you your behavior determines where you spend eternity. If you are a good person, you will go to heaven. If you're a bad person, you go to hell. And every Sunday you come to church, they remind you of how bad you are and all the stupid things that you've done and how you're walking towards hell because your behavior is incorrect. But the truth is actually the other way around. It's your belief that determines where you and I spend our eternity. Our behavior is what determines how we will spend it. So if you believe in Jesus, you're going to heaven. How? How you behave here on earth determines how you will spend your eternity in heaven. If you deny following Jesus Christ and if you deny that there's a God and if you deny that Jesus is Savior, you're going to spend, or not you, but this person, whoever this person might be, will spend their eternity in hell. How bad they were here on earth determines the degree and the level of punishment that they will have in hell. So your behavior matters whether you're saved or not because every person will be judged by their works but your salvation is by belief alone. And we see that clearly in the scriptures. So in case any of you are like, oh my God, this feels like a heretical teaching. Let us look at what Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine say. Okay, you ready to read this with me? This is liberating when you read it, okay? Here it is, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight to nine. God saved you by his grace. There's a word, grace. Space of grace. God saved you by his grace. When you believe, there it is. Not when you behaved. Someone say, praise God. Someone say, no, honestly, thank God. Thank God that I'm not saved by what I behave like. Because some of you are very good at behaving very good on Sundays. Let's keep reading. And you can't take credit for this. Why? Because it is a gift from? God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Come on. Give God some praise. Grace brings freedom. Grace brings peace. Grace relieves us from condemnation. Because your salvation is not based on your behavior. So, we're saved by our belief in Jesus alone, not through our behavior. But the reality is, your belief, though, determines your behavior. Mm -hmm. So, the reason why I tell that is because there are some people that say, I believe in God, but they don't live for him. You know what this is like? This is like as if I was 500 pounds, smoked all day, sat on my couch so much that I became a part of my couch. <laughs> Ate ice cream, donuts, and drank bubble tea all day. 500 pounds, smoking all day, sitting all day, drinking bubble tea, eating donuts, and having ice cream for dessert as a secondary dessert all day for many days. And then me saying to you, I believe in health. And in every post that I make, hashtag good health, <laughs> hashtag health, <laughs> hashtag fitness, <laughs> hashtag the grind, yeah, with the donut. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Would you really conclude, based on my actions, could you really come to a place to say, I believe that guy. I believe that guy believes in fitness and health. Can you come to a conclusion 
Or would you actually observe that my lifestyle is a contradiction to the words I speak? Look at me for a few seconds. There are some people that say, I believe in Jesus. But they live like demons. There are sometimes people that say, no, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe. And they have like Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Say, by grace. On their profiles or on their DPs or whatever. But man, their life is a contradiction to the words they choose to speak. Here is the truth. Listen to me. When we genuinely believe in Jesus, then God gives you a new heart. And when you genuinely believe in Jesus and God gives you a new heart, your life turns toward God. So you are saved by belief. And how you spend eternity is determined through your behavior. Second thing that I want you to understand is that there are two separate judgments. There's not just one judgment. There are two separate ones. The first one is titled the judgment seat of Christ. And this is a judgment only for believers. There are two judgments. There's not one. So a lot of us think that judgment day is just one thing where everybody goes, everybody's in the lineup, and everybody goes, and they have to be uh, told if they're going to be making it to heaven or if they're going to be making it to hell. That's not how the Bible teaches it. There are two judgments. One is called the judgment seat of Christ, and this is where all the believers are at. This is the judgment where all believers will be at. Only saved people will be at this one. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us... Everybody here is in each, amen? So that each of us may receive what is due for us, the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So I want you to think about the judgment seat of Christ like the Oscars of heaven. Where every single one of us will be rewarded for all the things that we did. Yes? It's going to be glorious. You thought the red carpet looked down? You have no idea. Heaven's got it for real. And the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I think it's chapter 3, that our works are going to be tested by fire. Someone say fire. Fire. And that there are going to be different types of works. There are some people that are going to bring works of gold, works of silver, works of precious stones. And so when they're tested, these works in the fire, gold doesn't melt. It doesn't, gold, sorry, gold will not burn. Neither will the silver. Silver will not burn. The precious stones will not burn either. But then the Bible says that there are others, there are other people's works that are going to be tested through fire in heaven. But they have works of straw, hay, and wood. What happens when you put straw, hay, and wood? It burns. It disappears. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that when people bring their works that were done here on earth, but they were only works of hay, straw, and wood, that they are going to suffer much loss. My question to you is this. What kind of works are you bringing to heaven? What are you doing with your life right now? Are you living fully devoted to Jesus Christ? When you're in church, are you inclined to listening? Or are you inclined to distracting? When you're in church and we're worshiping, what are you worshiping God like? Are you worshiping God in a way where your worship is contingent on your feelings? Or are you worshiping God in a way where your worship depends on his goodness, his faithfulness, his character, who he is? When, when, when God calls you to a challenge and when God calls you, hey, I need you to step up and lead more people to Jesus. When God tells you, I want you to speak to that co-worker about Jesus. When God calls you and says, I want you to spend 30 minutes praying today. When God is saying, hey, I want you to switch your schedule and spend more time for me. I want to ask you a question. What do you do? When God says, hey, you have 17 jobs. Drop 16 of them. Pick one, marry one, and then come to my house and worship me. I want to ask you a question. What do you do? Because the word of the Lord says this, that you can be saved. Someone say amen. amen. And there are people that are going to be saved that are going to be rewarded because they are working with works of gold, silver, precious stones. But there are people that are going to be saved that have no works. And they will even stand in a way ashamed. 
Because imagine this, right? Like, we're at the Oscars of heaven. Everybody's getting celebrated, right? And everybody's cheering, and so and so passes by. Works of gold. Ha, ah, the crowd goes wild. Jesus goes wild, gives the person a crown. And then another person comes in, and then your sister comes in, or your brother comes in, or your siblings come in, or your parents come in, and everybody's like, ah. And then you come up, and it's like this. Like, right you, like you right now. Quiet. Dang. I tell you the truth. If God called me to test my works and heaven became as quiet as you right now, I would shrink back in shame. As a matter of fact, there's a verse in 1st of John that tells us about this. 1st of John chapter 2, verse 28 says this. And now, dear children, say this word with me. One, two, three. Remain. remain. Say it a little louder. Remain. remain. It's one of my favorite words. If I ever got a tattoo, it'd probably be the word remain. Remain in my marriage. Remain in the trial. Amen. Remain in Christ. Amen. He is the vine. I'm the branches. This is such a good word. Remain. Someone say it with me. One, two, three. Remain. Now your children remain in fellowship with Christ. So that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. When he returns, it's speaking about the, right, at, this is the beginning of eternity. For you and me. Like, I don't know if this is true, right? But, have you ever been in a position where there's someone of authority over your life? You did something wrong with this person and they're a person of authority. Maybe you spoke bad about them. Maybe you said something stupid to them. Maybe you got into a fight, whatever. Maybe you did something wrong that you knew that you were wrong. And now you know that this person knows. What happens when you know that you did something wrong with an authority figure and now you're both in the same room? I'll tell you what happens. You avoid the person. <laughs> you don't even want to make eye contact with them. You can see them approaching and you're like, whoop, there I go. <laughs> because you know that they know that you know. Yeah. You know, they know that you know that you messed up with them. So now it's awkward. And you're too shy now. So it's awkward. When you're in the same room, you, you, you go quiet. You shrink back. Okay, if you've ever felt that, which I hope that some of you have because it makes my analogy a little bit more important. If you've ever felt that, let me tell you this. That's what it's going to be like with Jesus, but on steroids. You're going to shrink back. Because you did not live in devotion to him. You know what devotion means? Worship. Do you know what worship is? You should know. A continual outpouring of all that I and all that I do. do. Some of you are getting distracted. We started off with full devotion. Now it's 95%. It's not a big change. So it's not big enough to feel bad or convicted. But it's not the same thing anymore. And, and here's, what, here's, here's what John is saying. Hey, 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 live and remain in full devotion to Jesus in communion with him. So that when he returns and you guys enter eternity... You don't shrink back in shame. You can face them with boldness. There will be people in heaven who are still saved, but they possibly only lived for themselves, a self-centered life. So here's what will happen. They will shrink back in shame before God. What kind of works are you doing? Some of you used to serve the Lord. Now you don't. Some of you have never served the Lord and God is calling you and you're still deciding. Here, here's what God is trying to say to you. Listen to me. Remain in me. Yeah. Live in communion with me. Do something to serve in my kingdom because your works store up treasures in heaven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is why Jesus said it. I didn't say this, okay? So don't get mad at me. Jesus said, stop storing up treasures here on earth. Yeah. And guess what we end up doing? Because we're so smart. We end up storing treasures here on earth. <laughs> The second judgment is called the great white throne. This judgment will only be for unbelievers. If you made it to the great white throne, actually, none of us here will make it there. But if anyone makes it to the great white throne judgment, it is over. No more. That's it. That's it. It's over. No more second chances. No more evangelistical nights. Yeah. 
No more altar calls. No more repentance. It is over. Look what the Bible says in Revelations chapter 20, verses 11 to 12. And I saw a great white and the one sitting on it. That's Jesus. That's God. The earth. Look how powerful this great white throne and look how terrifying it is. It's so terrifying that the earth and the sky fled from God's presence. But they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. So this is not just older people. There's some young people in here. That's intense. Some people are like, oh, they're young. They don't really need to like hear about all that because they're young. No, the great and the small. When they have a conscience, they have to start believing. And there's some parents that are like, oh, they're young. Let them be kids. I'd be like, no. Yes, let them be kids. Yes, for sure. But they need to be kids that hear the word. They need to be kids that know Jesus. They need to be kids that serve. Parents have lost their thinking when it comes to Jesus and the church. We see some very amazing practical teaching from the Bible. We look at Hannah. She dedicated Samuel to Jesus, to God. You never see Hannah, the mother of Samuel the prophet, going and asking, hey, little Samuel, would you like to serve in God's house? Choo-choo. No. She's like, serve. As a matter of fact, I'm giving him away to the prophet Eli. I'm going to come see him once a year for eight days. She's dedicated. I'm not saying for you to like drop your kid off at church and leave him here. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Please don't think. What I'm trying to say is this. <laughs> that would be hilarious. So like, what are we going to do with all these kids? <laughs> see kids ministry. We need to grow. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is this. There, there, there are older people and there are young people. That's why I, I get amazed at the 6 p.m. when there's like a whole little section here of a whole bunch of little miniature people called children. That's why I'm amazed when I see all these four little girls like Ina and the three little girls behind her. This little kid right here beside John and Pat's, it's like they're practicing. Praise God. <laughs> I'm amazed. I'm amazed to see children in the church because this is what the church should be. Once they have a conscience, they don't need games. I don't think youth groups need more pizza nights with video games. You know what? You know what youth groups need? They need the Holy Spirit of God to breathe life into their bones, to speak truth that confronts their sin. This is what we need. We don't need entertainment. We need presence. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And watch this. And the books were opened. The books means that God is documenting everything about your life. Every intelligent thought that you've had, praise God, it is written down. But I'm so sorry to let you know, every stupid one too. Every wise decision, which might be few in some of our lives, written down. And all the dumb ones that we did, they're all written down too. Everything about your life is being documented just in case you forget. So that when you're in judgment, God's like, eh, <clears throat> page 365,000. Here's what you said. You said something stupid. <laughs> And then you have, and then God will bring it to your memory. As a matter of fact, if you really are forgetful, he'll play the video. <laughs> but look at this. The books were opened, right? The books of life, what you do, what you say, what you think. These books will be opened. But there's a particular one, including, the Bible says, the book of life. The book of life is the list of people's names that make it to heaven. And here's what the word of the Lord says. That your name in the book of life can be erased. At the great white throne, this judgment, the book of life will be opened. And God's going to use that as proof to you that says, your name not found. Here's what I believe. I believe that every single one of us that is born, our name is written in the book of life. But I believe that if we choose to deny Jesus, neglect him, and we choose not to follow Jesus, that name is then erased. I believe there are people that have denied following Jesus but still make it to church on Sunday. How do I know that? Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. But Lord, Lord, in your name we prophesied. But Lord, Lord, in your name we did miracles and cast demons and did all this and did all that. We did ministry, Lord God. And then Jesus will say, depart from me. You who break God's law, for I never, keyword, knew. No communion. Never knew. See how there were good deeds in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21? Good deeds? 
but it's the communion. How many lost people in the church? Like lily pads in a pond, floating, no direction. Sometimes I see people sitting, watching me preach, without really hearing what God is saying to them. They're just there. And the greatest mystery of 10 years is, I'm asking the Lord for revelation, is how people get distracted by the floor. I don't get it. It's been 10 years. I'm still asking the Lord in my prayer time. Lord, give me some revelation. People who come to church without the conviction to actually repent, even though the Holy Spirit is convicting them. And I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm trying to say there's a tsunami coming. People who say, I love God, I love this church, but my, my job needs me more. I'm busy with work. I'm busy with my career. I'm not saying a career is bad. I'm not saying that your job is bad. You actually need to work because if you don't work, you should not eat, the Bible says. <laughs> a lot of us would be a lot thinner. <laughs> Look at me for a few seconds. It's not bad to work. It's not bad to have a career. But you know what is bad? It's bad for you to replace Jesus yeah. and his house. Because some of you are like, I love Jesus, but I don't have to be at church all the time. <clears throat> Wrong theology. Here's what the word of the Lord says. The church is the body of Christ. Christ. How you treat the church is essentially how you treat Jesus. Yeah. Vice versa. How you treat Jesus is how you will treat his body. Yeah. And I'm not saying this for you because you're obviously sitting here. I'm saying this as an observation. The book of life. And watch this. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in. See, that tells you that everything that we do is being recorded, bro. You thought the CIA was sneaky? Mm. <laughs> there are some angels, bro. Yeah. They're the real central intelligence. <laughs> central intelligence angels. Amen. Here's the last thing I want you to believe. Oh, and by the way, when it comes to the great white throne, um, the same way there are rewards for those who are saved is the same way there will be degrees of punishment in hell. So not everybody's thrown into the same level of punishment in hell. There are different levels. So for example, let's just give you guys a quick example. There's a rich uh, businessman, let's pretend. And he decides to say, God is not real. I am my own mad. I'm my own man. I made my own luck. I don't believe there's a God. I don't believe that Jesus is real. And if other people believe that's good for them and that's awesome, but I just don't. I choose not to follow Jesus. I'm an atheist who chooses not to believe in God and I make my own luck. That person's gonna go to hell because they chose not to place their faith in Jesus Christ, which is the only way that you can get to heaven. Yeah. Now, Let's say that guy who's an atheist, rich, and amazing, does great things, charitable works and all that, but denied Jesus Christ. He, this person ends up in hell, but his punishment will be different than Hitler's. Yeah. Hitler killed six million Jews plus, maybe. Yeah. So God is fair. He's a fair, just judge. Yeah. Hitler will not receive the same punishment as this man. Yeah. This man will not receive the same because there are different levels and degrees of punishment. I wanted to bring this first, but it was a little too hardcore. It's in Romans chapter two, verse five. You know how Jesus says, store up treasures in heaven? You know what Jesus says about stubborn people? He says, because of your stubbornness, you will store up not treasures, but wrath. A little hardcore, right? You can go look for it if you don't believe me and fact check me, I really don't care. I'm just saying that because some people sometimes go like, I don't know if he's teaching truth. No, it's pretty real. It's just that you don't read the Bible so you can't recognize it. <laughs> Romans chapter two, verse five. Yeah. None of you will be in a great white throne. We will be in heaven's Oscars. But, but that depends on one thing and that's my third point. It's your choice. It's your choice. Someone say, it's, it's my, my choice. choice. 
Yes. Say all mine. All mine. Not pastors. Not pastors. Yeah. It's all yours. It's not your city group leader's choice. It's not your mama's choice. It's not your grandma that prays for you choice. Not your city group leader's choice. Not your friend's choice. It's yours. Here's what Jesus says. Piano, please. John chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. Mm. They will never be condemned for their sins. Someone say praise God. Praise God. I'm going to read that one more time just in case you didn't really hear it, okay? They will never be condemned for their sins. Yeah. It's not saying that God is being like, he, it's not like God is denying that you're bad. You are still bad. And you still will sin. But you will never be condemned for your sins. Wow. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death to life. Let's read it one more time. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message. Stop right there. Are you listening tonight? Or are you just hearing? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And he's warning you and telling you there is an eternal life after this one. Yeah. What are you truly believing in? Because your belief produces and determines your behavior. Jesus wants you to live devoted to him, to follow him, to believe in him at full capacity, not 95%. Jesus wants you fully devoted to him, not 95% devoted to him, 100. And if you can give 101, give that extra one. Jesus wants you to fall in love with him. Jesus wants you to choose him. And I'm wondering... Are you listening to his message today? Or are you just hearing? See, listening does this. Uh, boom. Hearing does this. Boom. Boom. Just good information. What's your response to the topic of eternity? Is it don't talk to me about it because I'm just too scared about it? Is it I'll think about it? Is it I'll just do something about it later? God doesn't want you to do something about it later. God wants you to do something about it right now. So if there are some of you in here that need to repent and need to say, Lord God, I've been walking away from you in eternity. And today I want to turn back to you. Then right now you can take that moment. Just you and God. Just you alone. Not me and you. You and him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So why don't you take a few minutes right there where you are at. If you need to go on your knees, go ahead. If you just want to bow your head and close your eyes, go ahead. If you don't want to do anything, I respect your decision. I just say, please repent. Turn toward him. Three, two, one. Your time is yours.